those whose rest is one. Oh, happy ones and holy, Lord, give us grace that we, like them the meek and lowly, on high may dwell with thee. You may be seated. Like to invite the Napier family, y'all, y'all come on up here. What a wonderful day. We get to dedicate a baby. I think this is perhaps one of my most favorite things we get to do at church. So congregation, if you'll look in your worship guides, we have a litany of dedication. The family will also join with us. So let us look at our dedication and as we dedicate little Cecilia to this day. We are gathered here today to worship God. Through our worship, we observe the biblical practices of those who lived long ago. One such practice is the bringing of a child to the place of worship to present or dedicate that child. Today, Adam and Michelle follow in the tradition of Mary and Joseph bringing the baby Jesus to the temple as they bring their daughter, Cecilia. They have chosen to have Cecilia dedicated in this place with this faith community present because we will be the ones to teach her, to love her, and to nurture her following the, the example of Christ. As Cecilia grows in our church family, how will we show her that she is created and loved by God? We will give her our love and include her in the experience of this church family. As a child of God, Cecilia has already brought much light and love to those around her. As she grows, how do we anticipate Cecilia growing into God's light and love? We look to the day when she will declare her faith in Jesus Christ and sit with us at the Lord's table to confirm the heritage that we pass along to her and with full commitment try to do God's will and work. And now to her parents, Adam and Michelle. I call your attention to the commands of God recorded in Holy Scripture. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 7 tells us, Hear, O Israel, the Lord God, our God, is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your hearts and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Oppress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Adam and Michelle love God and one another and model for Cecilia a wonderful love for God so that she will one day learn to love God. Do you, Adam and Michelle, promise with God's help to provide Cecilia a Christian's home of love and peace, to raise her in the truth of our Lord's instruction and discipline, and to encourage her to one day follow Jesus Christ as her Savior? And now for Logan and Jameis, and I have a question for you. Will you teach Cecilia about God, protect her from all harm, love her with all your heart, and be a good Christian example for her as older siblings? If you promise, will you repeat after me? Will you say, with God's help, we will. Thank you. Are you going to say it without my help? Because you could read, follow along. You are a smart boy. <laughs> Having heard these vows and sacred assurances, as a minister of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
I joylessly and with earnest prayer commend Cecilia to the gracious keeping of God, our Heavenly Parent. Now I'm going to hold her, and we are going to pray together. Come here. You want to let me hold you? Look out there. You look at everybody. What do you see? Let's pray together. God, you are the giver of good gifts, and we thank you for the gift of this child. We ask your blessing to be upon her as she grows. May she come to know your love for her through the actions of her family and the actions of all who call First Baptist home. We ask for your wisdom to be upon Adam and Michelle as they seek to raise her, for we know that children don't come with instruction books. So we ask that you give them patience and courage and fortitude. We pray for Adam and Michelle's extended family. We ask that you help them to be the presence of Christ as they care for and nurture little Cecilia. And we pray for our church. May we do the best of our ability to model to her what it means to follow you and to be your disciple. May we show her how to be your hands and your feet. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for letting me hold you. I think I just want to hold her the rest of the service. Is that okay? <laughs> so I have, a, you know, have a few little things. Here's a little baby's New Testament. And then we have a, a children's Bible story book. And then we have a certificate. Too. So thank you all so much. Do you want to go back? Okay. <laughs> And now we'll have children's time. So, Logan, you and Jameson want to come back up here for just a moment and come sit on the front pew? Y'all come sit right here with me. I am so glad you are here. Want to come sit right here? So do you know why, why, why were y'all just up there a few minutes ago? Do you know? You're not really sure? Yeah. Yeah? I'm not really sure why. Well, we were doing what we call a baby dedication. Um, in some churches, they baptize babies. I don't know if you've ever seen a baby being baptized, but some churches do. But in, but in Baptist life, we, we say baptism is something we do later, and instead, we dedicate babies. So that's what we did today. We were promising to help raise your little sister in God's care and to teach her all about Jesus. And we promised to help her parents and to help both of you, too, be big, big brothers, be good siblings. So we make promises. That's why we had y'all up on the stage with us a few moments ago. So I want to remind both of you something that you may or may not always remember, and that is that you are loved here at First Baptist. Children are very important. Um, we look forward to watching you grow up, and you are a ray of sunshine in our church. And when you come to church, I'm gonna tell you, let me tell you a little secret. Can I tell you a secret? On Sunday mornings, honestly, I really look forward to seeing the children most of all. I love these grown-ups out here, but I really love to see children in church. So I am so glad that you are here this day. So I'm going to ask you there's something you probably don't know about me. Do you know why I decided to become a pastor? Yeah. Well, you do know. Why do you think? That's, that's, uh, stop the bad guys. To stop the bad guys. Okay, that'll do. <laughs> That is it. That is it. Thank you. Yeah, actually, I decided to become a pastor because when I was growing up, I went to church on Sundays, and the people at that church where I grew up, they loved me so much. Even when I did things that weren't right, they still loved me. They taught me. They cared for me. 
So I wanted to do the same thing for others. I wanted to be a place where others could learn about Jesus, just like I did at my church. So friends, I am so glad that you were here this morning, and I'm glad for our children watching at home. You are loved. God loves you, and so does this church. So thank you for being here this day. Okay, you can go back to your parents now. Thank you. Thank you. I invite you now to open your hymnal to hymn 377. There is a redeemer. Sing all three verses. Thank you. 
This morning's scripture reading is taken from the book of, from the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses 9 through 17, I think. Yeah, we're going to go with that. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love each other. May God add the blessings to the reading of his holy word, for this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thank you, God. I'd like to welcome these folks to worship this morning, who are worshiping from home. Michelle Medlin, Diane and Mike Goodwin, Paige McMillan Goodwin, Betty and Bill Long, Sharon and Troy Lane, Timothy Lowry, Marja Kitts, Brenda Marchi, De- Deanna Heishman, and Sarah Clemen. We're glad that you all have joined us from home this day. As we enter into a time of prayer, have you ever seen the church signs like those on that video? Oh, how very sad because we come to proclaim a gospel of love and grace. So in the spirit of knowing that we are loved, you are loved by God, let us now enter into a time of prayer together. God, we are grateful that you are a God of love and that you show us your love in so many ways. But even in the midst of of your love, we have folks that we care for that are suffering this day. So we take just a few moments now to mention aloud those that we hold close to our hearts because we know that you love them too. Lord, hear our prayers. 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 prayers. Eternal God, who has created us, who has loved us, and who has cared for us as a parent cares for a child, We give thanks for the children in our midst, for the babies fresh with the hope of new life, for children who are growing and learning and sometimes teaching us, for the blessed uniqueness, for the holy promise of children, we give you thanks. But we confess, O God, that sometimes we view childhood through rose-colored glasses. We see only the fun and not the fear. We hear only the laughter and not the cries. Forgive us, O God, when we turn away, for it makes us uncomfortable to believe that some, for some, childhood is a painful and rocky road. Children, even in the midst of this prosperous country, whose minds, bodies, and futures There are those who are stunted by the lack of food, even though we have so much. There are children whose playmates are violence and poverty. 
There are children whose homes and families are not safe havens, but are rather places of fear and of danger, of abuse and neglect. Forgive us, O God, when we do not see, when we do not speak, and when we do not care for all of our children, for they are your children as well. May we speak up for those whose voices are not heard. May we stand for those who have no vote. And may we make a welcome place for all of the children of this world. For it's in the name of Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. When he rolls up his sleeves, he ain't just putting on the ritz. Our God is an awesome God. There's thunder in his footsteps and lightning in his fist. Our God is an awesome God. The Lord wasn't joking when he kicked us out of Eden. It wasn't for no reason that he shed his blood. His return is very close, so you better believe in that our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven to earth with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. When the sky was starless in the void of the night, our God is an awesome God. He spoke into the darkness and created the light. Our God is an awesome God. Judgment and wrath he poured out on Sodom. Mercy and grace he gave us at the cross. I hope that we have not too quickly forgotten that our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom. Some power and love, our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. God. So I believe it was on Friday that the CDC issued new guidelines in regards to masking, which I think caught many of us off guard. So our leadership in our church has not had time to meet. We'll discuss that, and we'll be in touch with you all about what we're going to do. I know when the pandemic first started, we had to make a lot of decisions really quickly, and I kind of feel like that's happened again. So we'll, we'll let you know what we're going to be doing in the future. But thank you for everybody today still continuing to wear your mask until we decide what's best to protect everyone. So thank you for that. So today, our scripture text comes from the book of 1 John. This is our last sermon in this series from the book of 1 John. I'm going to be reading chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ who has been born of God, and everyone who loves the parent loves the child. But this we know, that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments. For the love of God is this, that we obey his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome, 
For whatever is born of God conquers the world, and this is the victory that conquers the world, our faith. Who is that? Who, who is it that conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with water only, but with the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one that testifies, for the Spirit is truth. Let us pray together. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The name of our sermon this morning is Center of the Universe. Well, friends, have you ever heard yourself saying things that your parents once said to you? You just have to try one little bite, and you can't get up from the table until you do. Or my mom always tells me, don't embarrass the family. So I tell my kids that. Or, as a good Southern girl, well, bless your heart. Or as Shane says, he says what his dad says, which is, expect the unexpected. Well, my mom also used to tell me, The world doesn't revolve around you. You are not the center of the universe. Maybe y'all heard that before? Well, of course the world didn't revolve around me. I knew that. But you know, when you're a teenager or a child, your world is pretty small, and basically your life is about yourself. You are the center of your universe. But as we age, we should begin to realize that there are other people in the world and that we should begin to think about their well-being also. But honestly, I have met, and I'm sure that you have met people too that think that they are the center of the universe or maybe their family is the center of the universe. They are most important Their family is most important, and what they want is paramount. When I was a full-time youth minister right out of seminary, the youth group was full of teenagers who were very privileged. They lived in nice homes, they had nice clothes, they had nice cars. They never really wanted anything, wanted for anything. But in my previous church, the church that I worked in while I was in seminary, those teenagers came from working class families. Those teenagers loved to do everything we planned, whether it was to go to the beach or go bowling or go putt-putting or just hang out together and get ice cream at Friendly's. They were easily entertained. But in my second church, that youth group, Those activities that were fun in the last church were really boring to those children because they had already been there and done that. So they began to find other ways to entertain themselves, smoking, drinking, and doing drugs on church trips. Now, I never caught them doing those things, but you know when those things are going on. One time, I did find out after the fact, and that's a story for another day. So when I tried to talk to the parents and the parent council about what I thought was going on, about my hunches and suspicions, those parents of those privileged teenagers didn't want to hear it. You see, their children were were the center of their universe, and they did everything they could do to protect those children from consequences. It was almost as if they were blinded by the fact that their children were indeed children and they make mistakes. And how else do we learn? So often it's through our mistakes. But when your child is your everything, your center of your universe, when your world revolves around that child, it's really hard to acknowledge that that your children make mistakes. So just one crazy side note. I once heard one of those parents years later say, 
Well, I'm glad our children learned to drink at church. At least it was a safe place. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) So when I read these verses just a few moments ago, did you try to figure out what on earth the writer was saying? Maybe you tried to use linear reasoning. You know, this followed by this followed by that. Well, if you did, you probably are frustrated because this writer is going around in circles. The cumulative impact of these phrases, I think, is dizzying and confusing. Notions of belief, kinship, love, obedience, commands, victory, and faith, they all chase each other around in a continuous loop, sort of like the horses on a merry-go-round, or maybe the little figurines in a music box. I wonder how the writer of 1 John might feel if we were to say, trying to follow this text makes me dizzy. I imagine the writer might say quite cheerfully something like, yes, of course, that's exactly what I intended. Dizziness is my gift for all of you readers. Well, growing up, we used to play a game called Dizzy Bat. Have any of you ever played that game before? Well, let me describe it for you. Maybe we can play after church in a few moments. But what you do is you divide up into teams, and one person from each team would run to the other side of the field where a bat is. You pick up the bat, you put your forehead on the bat, and the other end is on the ground, and then you run around the bat 10 times. And someone's there counting to make sure that you get 10 times around that bat. And then you have to run or sort of run or crawl or fall or whatever back to the starting line so then the next person can go. So Dizzy Bat is quite a game. Well, honestly, when I read this passage of scripture, that's what came to mind, the game of Dizzy Bat. Why is the writer of 1 John using so many abstract categories and terms? Why is the writer going around and around with a bunch of theological words? And why is the writer using a bunch of sentimental religious jargon that sucks us into a rhetorical, dizzying swirl? Or perhaps, as David Schaeffler said, it is something like the orderly attraction of a stable gravitational field, one in which belief, kinship with God and one another, love, obedience, and the commandments of God are all elements encircling each other, held in orbit by the centering energy point. And that center is Jesus Christ. All of those theological terms are centered around the center, Jesus Christ. These verses are about what happens to followers of Jesus if they allow Jesus Christ to be the center of their universe. But that is so very challenging for us all because we would all rather have other things as the centers of our universes. All of us had rather have something else to center our lives around than Jesus Christ. However, these verses promise us that God's laws are not burdensome. What is required of us is love. Interestingly, when you read these verses very carefully, there's a twist when it talks about love. In other parts of the letter that we talked about the last several weeks, we read that the way we show that we love God is by loving others. However, these verses say that our love for God and our desire to keep God's commandments, those things prove that we love our brothers and sisters. Furthermore, this love of God is the touchstone for our love of others. The writer presents to modern Christians a sharper, more theological definition of communal love than what we normally hear. Not just any definition of love will do. We love one another as God intends only when that love grows out of relationship with God who is defined in God's saving activity in Jesus Christ. In other words, loving God comes first, then we are empowered and gifted to love others. 
Recently, Peter Marty, who was the editor of Christian Century, he wrote about the word in, enthralled. This is what he writes. I first learned the word enthralled while studying Shakespeare in high school English. We talked about that in English class. He said, it wasn't a word that I immediately began using. But when a teenage couple in the hallway would squeeze in some sensuous kissing time before the bell rang, I knew what the word enthralled meant. Mr. Taylor would come out from math class and tell the couple to stop exchanging spit and get back in class. You see, this couple was mesmerized. They were enthralled with being in love. Such is the enchantment of being enthralled. But then Marty goes on and talks about another word. He says, only once have I seen or heard the word disenthralled. Ever heard that word before? Disenthralled. It was used by Abraham Lincoln in his annual message to Congress on December 1st, 1862. It was delivered exactly one month before the Emancipation Proclamation took effect. The speech closes with several, several paragraphs designed to push Americans to rethink their views on slavery. Lincoln offered a glimpse of what was in his own heart. This is what Lincoln said. We can succeed only by concert. It is not. Can any of us imagine better? But we all can do better. The dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. The occasion is piled high with difficulty, and we must rise with the occasion. As our case is news, so we must think anew and act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves, and then we shall save our country. We know how to save the Union. We, even we here, hold the power and bear the responsibility. You see, Lincoln was positioning himself and Congress to under, understand the shift that was, that was taking place in the war about the understanding of preserving the Union. It now included the aim of ending slavery. In public opinion, with public opinion in the background, Lincoln wanted to do more than imagine a new America. He viewed the whole nation as capable of rising to the occasion of breaking its attachment to ideas that were once considered acceptable as slavery. Partly as a strategy to win the war and partly as a reckoning with his own evolving position on slavery, Lincoln sought a radical awakening from the status quo. We must think anew and act anew, and we must disenthrall ourselves, and then we shall save our country. So as Christians, what is holding us captive that we need to disenthrall ourselves of? What have we all made to be the center of our universe instead of Jesus? Perhaps our families, our children, our parents, our careers, our fondness for worrying, our money, our security, our insecurities, Netflix, success, our pets, our hobbies, our grudges and resentments, our anger, our lack of forgiving ourselves and others. It's truly amazing what we can make our lives revolve around. So what is it that we need to disenthrall ourselves of? Friends, no time is better than now to disenthrall ourselves of all that encumbers us and to decide to follow Jesus, not just on Sunday and not just when someone is watching, not just when life is going the way we want it to, and not just when we hit rock bottom. Putting Jesus in the center, loving God with our whole beings. Friends, let's do it today and in the days that follow. Amen. We are now going to sing a hymn of response, and as Sue plays and we sing, I come with joy, 
I invite you to think about that. What truly is your life centered around? You may have made a profession of faith years ago. I think almost everyone in this room has. But think about your life at this moment and what your center is. And as you sing, I encourage you to recommit your life to following Christ. I'm going to be down at the front for anyone who would like to make the decision to follow Christ for the first time, or if anyone would like to join with our congregation, I'll be down there waiting. Will you please stand and sing with us hymn number 456? Singing verses 1 and 5. joy, a child of God, forgiven, loved, and free, the life of Jesus to recall, in love lay down for me, in love lay down for me, together met, together bound by all that Christ has done, we'll go with joy to give the world the love that makes us one. The love that makes us one. You may be seated. together. Oh Lord God and Heavenly Father, as we come on this day, we truly give you thanks for the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us throughout this week and our lifetime. And Lord, as we gather in this place, we remember that it is our obligation to this church, to this community, and to the spreading of your word to give both our time and talents to the service of your people. Lord, accept that which is given this day out of love to you. Accept both the gift and bless the giver. For it's in the name of Christ we do pray. Amen. Be seated for just a moment, please. Just a few matters of common concern for us. The first is that 
We need help in our nursery, during worship, and also children's church. We are hoping to be able to attract more families, which we need to do, and we do need help there. We have not had the nursery open during COVID, but we're hoping very soon to be able to, to reopen that so that children can come. So if you're interested in helping us with any of that, please let me know. Also, the first Sunday in June, I believe, I don't have my calendar, but I believe it may be June the 6th, we are going to install two deacons um, to join our deacon team. Um, they're both here today, Mary B. and also Karen are going to join our existing deacons to provide care for our congregation. So thank you, both of you, for your willingness to serve. Um, and we'll have that installation service on the first Sunday in June. Also, make sure you look at your worship guide. There's several opportunities for service. Involve, uh, CCAP is needing some help. And then I still need some help preparing sermons for the month of August. If you have any questions about faith or any questions you want to God, if you can let me know, um, I'm hoping to preach sermons around some of those ideas the month of August. So that, that information's in the worship guide. And then next Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, we are going to have our business meeting that we've not been able to have in over a year. So our uh, different committee chairs have been asked to put their reports together, and then those will be available. I think tomorrow we're hoping to have those available. Kayla will have them in the church office if you want to stop by and read them. And then Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, we'll have our business session. Um, it'll be brief because we do have worship at 11. Um, if you're watching from home and you would like to be a part of that, we will put out, um, there will be information about a Zoom link, so that way church members can then Zoom in and be a part of that meeting if you're not able to be here next Sunday. So there'll be more information this week going out about that. Will you please stand for the benediction? My friends in Christ, as you leave this place, May the God who loves you travel with you. And may the God who seeks to be the center of your life direct you. So go now in peace to love and to serve. Amen.